Good morning. Uh, it is August 28th, Friday, August 28th. Uh, we are looking at sections 3.3 and 3.3b on gravity. Really one set of notes with two assignments that go with it. On Wednesday, you were assigned a lab. The lab that you were assigned was dealing with something you hadn't learned yet. Um, in terms of me being able to keep having labs with you every week, uh, this was what I have next in my supplies, and next in my labs, and so therefore that's why we had to assign it. But it's what we're covering today. So um, if you've already looked at it and we're a little bit confused, hopefully we alleviate some of that confusion here as we uh, go over this one. So I have even put that on this slide, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you look to see, and really it's not even Thursday the 27th, huh? It's, it's Friday the 28th. I wrote these before I even knew what the schedule was going to be for um, distance learning. So um, we need to go over the homework assignments from the start of chapter three. So chapter three, homework number one, and chapter three, homework number two. And of course, you've already turned those into me because they were due at the beginning of the period, which means that I got them by 8 a.m. Um, Question number one says the youngster on a roof, 19 meters tall, uh, stands at the edge and throws a paper plane one meter above so we can make the combined height a total of 20 meters. It sails around before landing directly in front of the person 15 meters in front of the building. What is the magnitude of the displacement? So when you go to solve for the magnitude of the displacement, here's a picture of it. So there's our building. When the plane you know, does whatever it does to get down here, what we really care about is the straight line distance from where it started to where it ended up. And so that makes it a vector quantity. Displacement is a vector quantity. That's why we use an S for that. And um, easy one, three, four, five, right triangle. Question number two, after lifting off its launch pad, a rocket is found to be 480 meters directly above an observer who is 360 meters due east of the launch pad. So maybe before I actually flip to the next slide, should be thinking about how would you go about solving this. So first thing is, is maybe you draw yourself a little rocket and then you're thinking about it taking off. And then what they say is there's an observer who is 360 meters this way. And so the rocket must be doing something like this to be directly above the observer, okay? So it's 360 meters this way and it's um, 480 meters directly above the person which means that the displacement of the rocket is really that diagonal, the hypotenuse. And so same thing, that is also a three, four, five right triangle. Question number three, a mouse runs straight north 4.14, how can I say it? 1.414 meters, turns to the right 90 degrees and runs another 1.414 meters. And we wanna know what distance did it run? Um, first of all, you probably were looking at that, why 1.414? Maybe you were thinking, oh, I know, that's the, the number that I heard from my math teacher that is root two. And so what we have here is a 45, 45, 90 right triangle, and that's a, another special right triangle that says that the hypotenuse is the length of one of the sides times root two. So it'd be root two times root two, which means that that distance there is two. Now you didn't need to know that because you have a calculator, you can plug in your calculator and solve it. And then maybe you also know that the, uh, when you have two legs that are the same length, that the angle that that makes inside the triangle right there would be a 45 degree angle, which means that one there would also be a 45 degree angle. Um, doesn't matter which angle that you're looking at. Well, if you're a regular physics students, I'd say no, it doesn't matter. And if it's 45 degrees, no, it doesn't matter. But in this class, as we progress through chapter four, no, chapter five, it's gonna matter. So make sure you know where the angle's being referenced from and that whatever you can solve, how you can apply that to find your reference angle. So if trigonometry says that's a 45 degree angle inside the triangle and that this whole axis is 90 degrees, uh, quadrant, quadrant one, then that means this must also be a 45 degree angle. And it's an important thought, so please don't just kind of brush that off. Number four, an android on guard duty in front of the Institute of Robotics is heading due south at 107 at a speed of 10. When it receives a command to alter course at 109, it is recorded to be moving 10 meters per second due north. Compute its average acceleration. So some might think that to find the acceleration, uh, the reason why this is thrown into the middle of this section is gonna make sense in a moment, that the average acceleration is how much your velocity changed by divided by the time. 
So if you're thinking about speed, 10 minus 10 is zero. So two minutes, what is that, 120 seconds? Doesn't matter, because 10 minus 10 is zero. It has no acceleration. Yet we understand in real life that doesn't make any sense. If the robot is moving in one direction, it's got to come to a stop and then start moving the other direction. There had to be a deceleration, acceleration. So now if we think about these as vectors instead, the fact that one of the directions I have pointing south as being the negative 10, doesn't matter which one's negative, going north is the positive 10 vector. When you subtract 10 minus a negative 10, or if you subtract negative 10 minus positive 10, in either case, you end up with 20, not zero. And then 20 divided by 120 gives us 0.167. Does the sign matter right here? Not really, because we really are just kind of looking at how the acceleration change, how, what the acceleration was as an average because of the change in speed. Question number five, while on a vacation, a tourist left the center of town, that's this location right here, uh, rented car, odometer reading of 26. Oh yeah, this one, I had some people, oh, no, it wasn't this one. Anyway, I might've screwed up these numbers at some point in time, but I can't be yet because we haven't gone over it yet. So my mind doesn't know where it's at. 26, 7, 25, travel Southwest for six hours then swung and goes northeast, that's the kind of pinkish purple vector, for 14 hours. And how do I know where to point it? I don't, other than I know that when the person gets to their last location, they're 420 kilometers directly due east of where they started. So I just had to make this one go out to where it came out on the x-axis. That's how I came up with my pixel. We want to know what was the average speed. Average speed says v equals distance divided by time. And then what is the average velocity says, what was your displacement divided by time? Okay. So for this one, 420 kilometers divided by 20 hours. And for this one, the odometer changed by exactly a thousand kilometers. That's the distance that you traveled and also divided by 20 hours. Okay. So recognizing, recognizing the difference between distance and time, velocity versus speed, your first lab actually asked you, you know, could we consider your speed of velocity? And the answer was yes, because the ball was rolling in one specific direction. So they both would be the same, but in this one, they're not the same. There are those. Question number six, which now starts the second assignment. We're now looking at vector components. A catapult fires a boulder with a launch speed of 20 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees. What are its initial components of speed? You might have kind of looked at this and thought, what is even the purpose of this? Well, it's going to be super important soon because by chapter four, we're going to be kicking footballs and launching cannonballs, and we want to know where they're going to hit the ground right there. And to figure out where they're going to hit the get ground right there, we need to know this component to know about the distance this way. And we need to use this component to find out how much time it's in the air. Because to find out the horizontal distance is going to be the x component of the velocity times the time that was in the air. So VIY allows us to find the time using our motion equation. We'll make more sense of that with today's stuff. And then VX allows us to find the distance in that particular direction. So that's coming up. It's kind of a hard section, maybe one of the harder questions on your chapter test. All right, so to find the components though, you're just simply doing sine and cosine of the angle. And so VIX is V times cosine and VIY is V times sine. If you're not getting these two answers, check to see that your calculator is in degree mode. A skier is moving at 10 meters per second down a ski slope with a 15 degree angle below the horizontal. At what rate is his altitude decreasing. All right, so um, we want to know what is this speed. The altitude is decreasing. How quickly are you getting down the mountain vertically? Obviously, the skier is not going vertical, but they still are going down the mountain based on this angle. Um, in maybe regular physics more than this class, we would talk about simple machines, and a hillside would be a way to get something down a hill in a way that's less aggressive than just free fall. I don't know over talking this we just want to know what that is that what the y component of that velocity is the y component if you moved it into this and made a triangle would be the side opposite of the 15 degree angle so i use sine 
Now you might notice, and this is true all the way through the end of chapter four, that the Y component always gets sine and the X component always gets cosine. In chapter five, when we're learning forces, that doesn't always happen. You guys will have to be able to be adaptable to when sine is used and when cosine is used. But right now, it's always this way. Question number eight says, a duck is flying northwest at 10 meters per second, uh, 45 degree angle, and we want to know at what rate is it flying north. So, um, you know, it's got to get to a certain, you know, it's got to get from like, let's say, central Mexico to Canada. You're going to probably be following paths that lead you to different water sources and food sources. But in the end, you got to get north, right? So we need to know what is the component of, of velocity in the y direction. So based on the angle that I have here, if I were to put the Y component on this side, I'm still using sine, okay? So maybe I should start talking about chapter five. What if we had measured this as our 45 degree angle? Then I would be using cosine to find the Y component. So it's where the angle reference is off is how we decide sine or cosine, but I'm getting way ahead of myself, so I'm gonna stop talking about that. There's number eight. Number nine. All right, so now we're getting to that stuff that was so difficult in the uh, notes last time. And in fact, I hurried us through this problem because I had to get on to something else. Right now I've got uh, 10 minutes till my next class starts, but then not another an hour till I need to Zoom with them. So we're doing just fine on time today. I need to redo your lab. The lab that is that by the time you've already got this video, the video is fine. But when I did the first recording of it, there was no sound. And so I have no idea why it recorded without sound. I now practiced since then, and the sound's there. So why the sound didn't show up the first day, how annoying. I don't have that kind of time to waste. Okay, so first thing is we have a four meter long and a three meter long vector. They have their angles. Remember that adds up to a hundred. So these are not perpendicular to each other. So when you go to take your vectors and you draw the blue vector pointing at a 20 degree angle this way. This is how a drafts person would do this. Then you take your pink vector and you draw it 80 degrees off of that. Remember, you'd have to really, what you would be doing is like if we had a, a lab on this in class, which we would in, in chapter five, is we would have to draw a new coordinate system right here that's you know parallel to these two axes so we could now measure the 80 degree angle off of right here. So if this is an 80 degree angle and this is a 20 degree angle, this is 20 because this is 20, alternate interior angles are congruent, that adds up to 100. So these are not perfectly uh, perpendicular to each other, so you can't just pythag them if that's what you chose to do in your homework. Um, so instead I gotta find their components. I know that the answer, the answer vector is gonna fall, Let's see what color, we'll use black for the answer vector. The answer vector is gonna fall like that. Okay, so how did I get that answer vector? Well, if I took the X component of the blue vector, which goes out about that far, then subtracted away from that, the X component of the pink vector, which goes back the opposite direction, you can see that those two vectors add up to the X, add up to the X component of the black resulting vector. So there's what my answer comes out to be. See how that kind of perfectly lines up? Meanwhile, in the vertical direction, the Y component of the first vector pointing straight up plus the Y component of the pink vector, notice I said plus that time, not minus, because they both point in the same direction, gives us a resulting vector that is from here to there, okay? Now, those two resulting black vectors, we Pythag those together to find the black actual vector. So I need to find those pieces. So first thing is to do the X and Y components of both A and B. Once I get those values, uh, you'll notice that mathematically, because I put my 80, uh, no, I don't know, I need to point out to you something that hasn't really been pointed out yet. Because I'm measuring 80 degrees off of the negative X axis, I made the X component a negative vector, okay? Another person might just go with a 120 degrees on their calculator, not 120, just 100. Where did that come from? I'm adding 120 plus 80 and getting 180. I don't think I'm adding my stuff right. Another person might take a 100 degree angle and plug that into their calculator, three times cosine of 100, and they're going to get negative 0.52. 
Right? It should, because all this stuff has to fit together. So anyway, I don't do that. I always use the acute angles, less than 90 degrees. And I know to put the signs in based on where the actual vector is at, because I draw pictures. All right. So now we can see that these two, when we add them together, really we're subtracting. And these two, when we add them together, we're adding. And that gives us our CX and our CY. There they are, subtracting, adding. And then to find out C, I would just take C equals the square root of 3.24 squared plus 4.32 squared. And that must have come out to be 5.4. That's the resulting vector along there. Then the angle that it makes. Um, okay, now this is going to be a little weird because based on the angle that I have written here, I've taken, no, it doesn't, this isn't weird. I'm, I'm making it weird because I'm looking at the picture that what, that's up here. I am not, I'm going to repeat this, make sure you're listening. I am not finding that angle right there. If I'm finding that angle right there, I can't use tangent because these are not perpendicular to each other, even if they look it. So you can't do that. You can't fall back on that. So what we have to do instead is let's use the fact that in this picture, let's go back to our black resulting vectors that we had earlier. The X component for black is this one. The Y component in black is this one. And if you took that Y component and moved it over to here, it completes the triangle. And now we can say inverse tangent of this one, CY, divided by this one, CX. And that's how I got 53 degrees. So this is a 53 degree angle. Okay, important step. That question, it's a good one. It's a good thinking question, but you don't have any test questions like that. Number 10 is more, I don't even know to say that you have a test question like this. I'm not supposed to talk about that right now. I'm supposed to talk about test questions during Zoom to uh, benefit those people who come to the Zooms. This question just has AP written all over it because of the fact that it's dealing with two vectors that are not vectorally compatible. A hawk is 50 meters above a mouse. That is a displacement vector. The mouse is directly below it, running north at two meters per second. That is a velocity vector. If the hawk is going to dive, at what speed and angle does the hawk need to go straight down at a constant speed so that it catches the mouse right there? Okay. So since they asked me for what is the velocity, I just wrote down V equals question mark, which means that then that means I have to somehow turn this into a velocity vector. Or the reverse is, since I know the time it takes, and this is probably the way I did this on the slides, because I think this is a little bit more, it makes more sense. If this is what, how much time it takes, couldn't we just say that the distance that the mouse runs in five seconds is two meters per second times five seconds, which means then it went 10 meters. So I can now use 50 and 10 as a way to find the displacement vector along this hypotenuse. Once I have that displacement vector to turn it into a velocity vector, I'll just divide it by five seconds, right? The displacement along this divided by the time it takes to get down to there would be the average speed or constant speed, constant velocity to get there. Then the angle, it doesn't matter if it's velocity vectors or displacement vectors. If the two vectors are compatible, this angle inside here is based on either 10 divided by 50 or it's based on two divided by five, right? Because I just turned S sub Y, 50 divided by five means that this is really also, it's like the hawk went straight down, would be a five meter per second velocity vector. Hope I don't over confuse you with this, but if I did, good. You're in AP physics. It's time for you to start stepping up to these kinds of things, huh? All right, plugged all that in. I, like I said, I turned it into a, uh, displacement in the x direction that gave me the distance along the hypotenuse divide that by five gave me the time or speed i'm sorry and then dividing those two displacements to get the angle good times all right gravity what your next lab is on uh it starts with just a little bit of interesting trivia just to point out that you know how the greeks used to sit around um once we learn how to cultivate our food it's given human beings a lot more time to sit around and think about things. And um, along with extra, you know, weight around the mid midsection that that might give, 
It's also given people time to become, to invent the technology that we have because they started to think about things. So um, cultivation, there's a book out there called Ishmael. It's a good read. It explains where a, uh, a gorilla takes a human being as its student and explains how we've gone wrong. And one of the things it describes in there is a story of Cain and Abel and describes that, uh, that Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. Now, you don't know all this stuff in the Bible because the Bible doesn't spell all this out. The story of Cain and Abel is a lot older than um, the ancient Hebrews. And what the idea was, was that the people who cultivated the land, the farmers, actually had destroyed all of the, uh, the nomadic abilities of, the, of early people. And so that story ended up being represented by two brothers where one kills the other. So um, was that killing bad? Well, it wasn't bad for us being able to, uh, to evolve our thinking because we now have time to sit around and think. So apparently this guy, Strato, was sitting around and watching water droplets dripping off the edge of a building. And he noticed that when he could see two at the same time up close to the top of the building, they were closer together. And when he was looking at two down closer to the bottom, that they were further apart. But he recognized that the drops were coming off in an equal interval of time, right? Drip, 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 right? Same time. So as he thought this out, he realized that there must be something that's happening that is speeding up the water droplet as it falls. And so acceleration was really something that was started in um, before the Common Era times, even though we really don't give credit to it till we talk about people like Galileo and the Leaning Tower of Pisa and all of that kind of stuff, huh? Um, your second lab, the one that would be already turned in now, was a what we like to call a diluted gravity lab. Galileo did that. He recognized that instead of dropping an object straight down, if you could have it slide down an inclined plane that didn't have any friction, that you basically have the acceleration of gravity in a much smaller value. Right, so some of you maybe had a, a acceleration of gravity of like one meter per second squared. That's a whole lot easier to time, and so that's the diluted gravity of inclined planes. But it's really, you know, you take an inclined plane. Some of you had an inclined plane like this. Some of you maybe have one like this. Well, what is free fall? That's when it's perfectly straight up and down. So, um, yeah, I don't know what a Galileo. Did Galileo come up with the roughly 10 meters per second squared? I'm not really sure. Probably should know that, but you know, it's, it's 11.39 right now. I'm hungry. So my brain, man. Anyway, 9.8. We round that to 10 whenever you want to. And notice what it says there. And I think there was actually some good slides with this was pictures showing that it doesn't matter if something's going up, going down, or going sideways, or at an angle, that the gravity vector the, it's a force vector, but you can also call it an acceleration vector, always point straight down. So with it pointing straight down, do you call it a positive or a negative? Well, that all depends on whether you're considering up or down to be positive or negative direction. So we need to address that as we go into today's examples, which aren't very much, and with two assignments on it. The other thing that's not very much is if you are a big fan of motion equations now, you'll notice that there's not a lot of motion equation givens in these problems. There's things that we have to assume. So a salmon is dropped by a hovering eagle. Poor eagle. Can you imagine all that work to get that salmon and then you drop it? Delicious. I mean, is there anything better than salmon sushi? Man, fresh salmon sushi, just sashimi. I don't want any rice on it. I don't want anything else ruining it. I want just that salmon raw. It's just delicious. And it's killing me right now, 1140 in the afternoon. Um, I don't know what other stories you want. I was riding my bicycle home one day a couple years ago, and I hear this screeching, and I'm like, what on earth is going on? As I get closer up to some power poles, there's an, there's not an eagle, but it was a hawk that's up on this pole, and it's surrounded by like maybe five or six crows, and they're all on the wire and, the, and on both sides of this hawk. And as I get closer and closer, I realize that on the ground is a couple more hawk, or a couple more crows. So all together, there's probably about 10 crows, like maybe four on the ground and six up on the wire. And I, what I realized was the hawk had caught a rabbit. 
But the problem is it didn't have a chance to eat the rabbit when the crows saw this going on and came and stole the meal, right? So poor salmon dropped by the eagle, probably somebody's going to get it. Good stories, huh? So here's your salmon. The minute it is dropped, it has no velocity. Hey, we actually do have some of our givens here. And then it's going to free fall down to the ground. So we want to know, I don't know, we shouldn't say that it hits the ground because we don't know how far the ground is below. We just know that this occurs in a time frame of 2.5 seconds, right? And we want to know how far will it fall, S equals question mark. That's not enough information to solve a motion equation unless we think about the fact that this is a no air drag means free fall, A equals 9.8 or 10. You decide which one you're going to use based on whether or not you need to get a calculator out. And that if it's dropped, that its initial velocity is zero meters per second. Now this becomes S equals VIT plus one half AT squared. There is no initial velocity. So the distance equals one half of 9.8 times 2.5 squared. The way I do this is I always write down 9.8. But if I can look at this problem, like if this had been a four, it'd be one half of 9.8 times four squared. Four squared is 16. Half of 16 is eight. So 10 times eight is 80 rather than getting out a calculator and solving it. So if the numbers are easy, use 10. If the numbers aren't easy and you gotta use a calculator, use 9.8. AP test doesn't care. 31 meters. Example two. Now, same problem. It's just that instead of being dropped, the ball is thrown. So what do we know? We know that there is initial velocity. And we want to know what speed does it hit the ground. And we also want, uh, we also know, oh, I'm sorry, I should also go with what we want. We also need to know the time. And then now what else do we know is that even if something is thrown downward, it's still accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. Remember, uh, air resistance is negligible. So it doesn't matter if it's dropped or thrown, it's still going to accelerate. It's just that now we know it's going to actually be traveling faster, right? If this, on this last problem, if the hovering eagle was, was mad, said, forget it, I'm not even going to eat the salmon. It threw the salmon downward. It just means that in 2.5 seconds, it'll actually fall farther than 31 meters because it had that initial velocity. So this is contributing to the distance and this is contributing to the distance, but not in problem one, only in problem two. Now, I'm going to do this problem backwards because I want to start with part B. I'm, in the end, when you draw this into your notes, you'll do it as part A first. I just want to point out something in part B. If you wanted to solve this problem in part B, you'd be doing the same thing we did in example one. You'd be saying S equals VIT plus one half AT squared, but this time we know that S, 100 meters, equals 10 times T plus one half of 9.8. Can I just call that 4.9? One half of 9.8 is 4, around 5. 5t squared, okay? you got to have some skills if you want to be able to solve that. Now, you're probably not going to believe this, but you have those skills. You just don't know you have those skills. You didn't have me as your math three teacher to know that you have those skills, right? Not that I'm so great. It's just that really when it comes to math three, I'm, I'm great. Um, just kidding, uh, but I'm great. Uh, because I teach the math three towards physics, right? So I know ahead of time what's important. And so we could look at the parabolic nature of a function that we could do here and actually figure out the times by working the quadratic. Eh, that's because we're in a math class. We have to do that. In physics class, we don't. There's never a time we have to solve a quadratic, but your TI inspires will do it. You should learn how to do it. It's just a skill worth having because if you get stuck on a problem, if you couldn't solve part A, you could fall back on using the uh, skills of the calculator to still give you an answer for the time, okay? But because we want to find the speed first, we can use the equation VF squared equals VI squared plus 2AS. Now we have enough information. VF squared equals 10 squared plus 2 times 9.8 times uh, 100. And we can solve for the speed. Once we know the speed, let's not use the equation VIT plus one half AT squared. That's not now a good choice of equations because we still have to use a quadratic. How about if instead we use VF equals VI plus AT? 
because now once I know the VF, I can plug into this equation, whole lot easier equation to use anyway. All right, so answers for that. I see I didn't even show much work when I did this on my slides. Now I might've done more work on your slides, but on mine, I just don't find it worthy. At this point in time, students should be able to use equations. They should know which one to use and when. You should recognize, now this is something you shouldn't know yet, but you should recognize that if there's something happening that's trapping you, this class is all about traps. The AP test in this class is all about traps. My joke is the AP test basically is some dirty old man saying, here, little kid, here's a piece of candy. They're trying to walk you into a trap. So you always have to be ready to try to catch what it is that they're doing. The easiest way to catch what it is they're doing is if you can't solve something, if you're like, we can't solve this, you know that there's another way to do it, okay? All right, one last thing to talk about is, is there is error resistance. So how do we factor in error resistance into these problems? Well, a free fall problem means it's free of that. So air drag does actually contribute to the fact that in ancient times, in fact, I think I wrote this in here, didn't I? Most people believe that falling bodies descend at a rate proportional to their weight. So in other words, they think that heavier things accelerate faster than lighter things. That's not true. The reason why we think that's true is because if you drop a styrofoam ball and a baseball, which I would be doing for you in class, they're going to hit the ground at the same time. But if I were to go outside up to the second story and drop them, we're going to see the baseball hit first. And that's because with them both having the same surface area, the one that has more weight will have a larger force of gravity vector, but then its air resistance vector doesn't affect it as much. The one with lesser weight, its velocity, its force vector is smaller and its air resistance vector becomes a problem, right? Quicker. And so it hits its terminal speed quicker and that's why it appears to fall uh, less quickly. Now, I just opened up a can of worms that I should probably point out. Why does everything fall at the same rate? Okay, so if you take the formula, I see we haven't learned this yet. I'm not supposed to talk about this yet. Next chapter, we're going to talk about F equals MA. That is the most important equation in physics. It is the Newton's second law equation that says a net force causes a mass to accelerate. What's the net force? Gravity. If you rearrange the solve for acceleration, it becomes A equals F over M. A lot of textbooks write the uh, F equals MA in this form because this really is better for describing gravity. There's a larger force on something that weighs more, but it also has a larger mass such that the division of these two always gives the same ratio. I'm getting way ahead of myself. I'm supposed to be showing you pictures here that say the object starting with a zero speed has no air resistance because it's not pushing through air. So as it starts to accelerate, it starts picking up speed. As it starts picking up speed, now it creates an air resistance as it breaks through the wind, right? It's breaking wind. Um, as it does that, its acceleration becomes less than 9.8. Eventually, it reaches the point where its air resistance reaches the gravity force, and now it has no net force on it, and it reaches its maximum speed, and its acceleration is zero. Does that mean it's just hovering there? Well, in the immortal words of... Um, George went in the TV show Cheers back in the 80s when Woody said, well, we should go skydiving. All you do is you sit up there and hover. And he goes, yeah, while well, the earth hurls up at you at 110 miles per hour, right? So it feels like you're hovering there. Obviously, you're not. You've reached a terminal speed where you're now no longer picking up speed. So going from the very first picture, here you're picking up speed the fastest while your speed is the least. Here... You're picking up more speed, just not picking it up as quickly, but you're still going faster until eventually you're not picking up any more speed because you've reached your maximum speed. Good times. I most of the time don't get to cover this because it's like a third day that this falls on or whatever, and we don't get to talk about this. And now because of distance learning, we got plenty of time to talk about everything. We just don't get you to get to ask me the questions. You can ask those on Zoom days. So your assignments are... Chapter three, homework number three, and chapter three, homework number four. They're both the same thing based on gravity. This is really easy. Probably most of you are already done before even uh, this period would actually even end. All right. Um, can't think of anything else. Talk to you later.